week before the wedding, I still lived in the dormitory, wearing my blue flannel robe and slippers of frying pan in hand. I exited my room and headed toward the kitchen. At the end of a long, dimly lit hallway, I had taken more than five steps when the door behind me opened. I automatically turned around to check who was coming out of Aksakova's room. We, the first year students, secretly called her a prostitute. Can you believe it? We said, three boyfriends in one semester. A crew cut muscular giant in a sleeveless undershirt and soldier's boots walked toward me. I stood rooted to the floor trying to convince myself that I was mistaken, that it was another soldier on furlough or AWOL, not Danya. But if he wasn't Danya, why was he staring at me? Why was he here? To get past the security babushka, I needed a student friend, and he hadn't known anyone but me. How had he found at Sakaba? And how had he managed to stay after visiting hours? Danya? He stepped forward, hooking his thumbs behind his army belt, narrowing his eyes at me. Who? Oh, he asked with done his voice. Stop kidding. How did you get here? I thought you were serving in Bluegorn. He moved so close, I could smell the heady musk of his sweat mixed with alcohol. He said, why should it matter? I understand congratulations are in order, and I heard condolences are in order. And how is your Svieta Kuchevskaya? Is she waiting for you to come back from the army? Svetka? How should I know? Svetka, Lyrka, Tanka. Oh, they're all the same. But surely not that Sakaba. There are rumors she is easy. I count on it. He kicked his heels as though he had spurs on them, and with his two fingers mimicked a cavalier suit. Adieu! His hand remained at his temple for a long time. His words and gestures, too high a barricade for me to climb, I waited for him to lose his cool and buckle at the knees. Thirty seconds must have passed. Then suddenly, he winced, his face hardened into a mask. He swung around and sauntered back to Aksakov's room. Did I just see Danya's doppelganger? Things couldn't be what they seemed. If Danya had accidentally run into me, he should have acted surprised, not impudent. But at the same time, that could be a coincidence. Why not? Something dropped to the floor with a clang. I looked down and realized it was my frying pan. Following my graduation, Ilya and I moved to Minsk. We had two children, Yulia, ten months after the wedding, and Yuri, nine years later. In the late 70s, a wave of Jewish emigration swept through the Belarus, but we couldn't convince my parents to leave the land they had defended. By 1988, we had decided that things in the Soviet Union weren't going to improve in our lifetimes. We were stuck in our careers, unable to advance because we were Jews. We feared our children might not gain admission to any college. The acceptance of Jews was as tightly controlled as ever. In addition, after the Chernobyl nuclear fallout, I became paranoid about food. The look of gargantuan mushrooms and berries I would have considered lucky to buy before Chernobyl now filled me with dread and desperation. Everything I bought or grew in a small patch of land in our dacha was contaminated. The authorities kept saying that our area was safe, that people around us were getting cancer or dropping dead of heart attacks or strokes in numbers far exceeding the usual. My dear parents among them. On the day of our departure from the USSR, I let my husband continue talking with other immigrants inside the Brest train station and went outside for a breath of fresh air with the children. I stood watching the buzzing people and hill, scurrying to buy tickets or get seats assigned. I had always thought how unlucky we Jews were, living in Belarus for at least half a millennium and still treated as unwelcome guests. But now, just hours before the departure, it hit me. No, 
We were the luckiest Soviet citizens on earth. We could leave. We had countries that wanted us. Israel, the US, Canada, Australia, Germany. But who wanted ethnic Russians or Belarusians? It seemed that even their own country was overburdened with taking care of them. I held four-year-old Yuri by the hand, afraid he might wander away. A 13 Yulia with her burning black eyes and waist-long braid attracted as much attention as I had when I was her age. After turning 30, thinking a serious woman should have short hair, I cut mine. I inhaled deeply, anticipating the sorrow that an emigrant must feel when leaving her country. The air was filled with soot wafting from the tracks, and jelly donuts sold nearby. <laughs> Without sinking my teeth into the mushy dough, I knew they were stale. They almost always were. And now, brushed past them. I leaned back and lost my balance. He quickly extended his arm to make sure I didn't fall, then held me for a moment longer than necessary. Pressing his large fingers into the fabric of my gray wool jacket, clutching it, a cry froze in my throat. It was Danya! His hair only reached the tops of his ears, in a regular haircut. Dressed in a much used suit, stained knitted tie, reeking of vodka, he looked like an office worker returning from a business trip. His blue eyes were red ribbed, probably from having too much of a good time away from home. Though he didn't carry his body as defiantly macho as he had when I met him last in the hallway of my dormitory, his face hadn't aged much. Lean, sobered, and smiling, he would still cut a dashing figure. He looked at my children, must Yuri's long hair, and still not speaking a word to me, offered him a chocolate cake. A squirrel, my favorite. My son looked at me. Can I take it from this uncle? I nodded and said, he is a very nice man. I had thought of Danya often, for the first several months after bumping into him at the dormitory. That is an inch baby. From time to time, our classmates reminded me of his existence. They told me that no sooner had he been discharged from the army than he met a girl and married her in three days. I felt numb to the news, as if it were something I'd read in a newspaper about a stranger. We had gone our separate ways, so we might as well marry. He stepped back from me and swayed. A nice man? No. Your mama was a smart cookie. She figured out I was no good. I am no good. She saw right through me. I'm a bad apple. I have a worm inside. He bared his teeth and glared at us laughing unnaturally like a clown. Stop it! What's wrong with you? Everything. Nope. It couldn't be another coincidence. His accidental bumps into me had to have required mind boggling planning. But every time, he'd waited until the very end, when, say, for a heroic effort, nothing could be done. Everything? My God, are you ill? Only oh, here, the tapped the heart gathered on his chest. Drunken melodrama or the truth? I couldn't tell. Where do you live now? I asked, as if we were simple acquaintances for the kids' sake. Do you have children? What do you do? Are you married? He spread his arms and looked at me, his laugh verging on madness. You want me to tell you all this now? Where were you 14 years ago? Twelve, ten years, a year ago. Now there's nothing you can do about it. He paused, looking at me as though he were taking a picture he was going to examine for the rest of his life, and cut the air between us with his hand and strode away. Danya, I yelled after him. Nope, I wasn't leaving behind soot and stale donuts. I wasn't leaving behind the USSR or Belarus or Minsk or any other land. I was leaving behind Donna. Julius.